All right, this is day two of the apprenticeship program that we're doing with Lake Technical College in Eustis, Florida. I was on vacation, so Bert was teaching day two. And day two, Bert goes over some of the things, reviews some of the things that he talked about the day before, and then also goes into the basic refrigeration circuit. So you're going to get an interesting look into the mind of Bert and how he thinks about the refrigeration circuit. Hope you enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do some hands-on review for safety. Let's go. Christian, any chance you could tell us exactly how many pounds of refrigerant are inside is inside this tank? Yeah. All right. Let's do this then. Look at this pro, man. It's on zero now. I already zeroed it out. Yeah. The clock is ticking. No pressure. We're all getting so bored. Great. Like 16 pounds? 16 pounds? Wait, you did the math in your head? Hold up. Let me check this. 16.72. So how, how did you figure that out? Tear weight. Tear weight? Yeah. All right. Absolutely. And a tear weight tells us what? 27.7. OK. And what does tear weight mean? The weight of the can. The weight of the can with nothing in it. Yep. Exactly. All right. So how many pounds are we? What's our total? 43. 43 minus 27.7. I can do this. 43 minus 27.7. I did it. 15.3. He said something like 16, and that was like. And then I redid the math with the decimal. What a guy. What a guy. All right, and he wasn't even here at the class. Anybody was here yesterday that could not have done that? Good. I wouldn't have admitted it either. That's great. One of you guys hook up to the tank. The way we would, let's just not open any of the valves yet, okay? So we'll keep pressure out of the, out of the equation. Okay. Let's see if you can remember. Had you ever done recovery before that? Before? Before that, yesterday? Uh, yes, I mean, in, in, in vision. Yeah, I've but you hadn't done it yourself. I hadn't done it myself. Okay. Uh, while he's doing that, what is the capacity that we should be filling these tanks to for safety? 80%. 80% capacity. And how do we know what the tank's capacity is? Anyone? Uh, Brian formula. Formula. So you can look up the formula for converting what to whatever type of refrigerant? The water column. Yep, you said it. Louder! The water column. You said it. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So what's the water column on this? Anybody? Water column is uh, 47.7. Sweet. 47.7. Okay. So it has, if it was water we were filling it with, full capacity 47. Um, but as we talked about, water is a different density than refrigerant. Each refrigerant has a specific density. So you would actually need to do the math. I think with 14A we did last time it was like uh, multiply it by 6.67. Being able to know that and actually making sure that you're filling up to 80% capacity keeps you safe because why? Because you might be able to fill it up and it'll be fine, but then what happens when it gets warmer? What, what is, it expands temperature, pressure. You're always expanding pressure. When you add temperature, you're going to have a higher pressure. Okay? All right, so this is your recovery machine that you're going to hook up to. You're already hooked up to your system. Uh, can I just do this one? Yep, better. Uh, better. Mm-hmm. That's great. Okay. Anybody know what this is? That's the cap to that. Yep. yep. All right. Somebody with gloves, put it on. Show everybody how it goes on. And what does this cap do? When would you use it? Okay. Yeah, and protects it from what? Yeah, because what if this tank falls and so, and it hits here before it hits the rest of the tank? You're likely, with the weight of it, if it falls any height, to snap it off. And like Damian was saying, what were you saying about that? That will go right through a cinder block wall. Yeah. So you, it'll actually fly. So there's a proper form that you have to do that you'll never get hit by. Yeah, which you, you guys missed out, and you're never going to ever probably ever know about this, but there is a, a magical form that if you do with your body, the tank will never hit you. I got it on video. 
He, oh, okay, you might hear about it at some point. So it's on video. Yeah, yeah, we found this out. So, okay, that's great. And then what else do we got going on here? Transfer Chained. 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 Yep. Mm-hmm. So uh, will somebody volunteer to chain the nitrogen tank in there to the dolly? You just asked if he should leave the nitrogen regulator on it when he's moving it. No. All right. Because that makes it way more likely to catch and actually snap the top of that off. Absolutely. And if you get hung up, just ask anybody around you, Josh, for some help. I'm going to put this right here. Sounds good. I'll take it out there, actually. All right, guys. That sounds good. You guys should watch this pro. He is actually putting a cap on there. He took off the regulator. He's putting a cap. My man. How many pounds of pressure do these tanks usually come with? 2,500 is pretty typical. Yeah. For a night big or small. The nitrogen tank, big or small. Well, I don't I don't know about yeah. Pretty much big or small. You're gonna it's it's like two thousand five hundred. Pretty typical. Why? What are you seeing? Well, I'm just saying, like those, those big nitrogen tanks, like they gotta have way more. Volume. They have more volume, there he goes. but it's not necessarily pressure. more pressure. Oh, pressure. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what? Like you know, you might be able to pressurize four systems with this, 20 systems with the other, both at 200, 2,500 psi when they first come out. So, woo, woo. Let's do the glove cap. The glove clap. All right, so uh, go ahead, put on the regulator. Um, or actually, we'll just pass the regulator. We'll, we'll just start out with that. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. Um, what does the first gauge tell us? What's in the bottle? Yep, the pressure of the tank. Yep. And then this one will tell you how much your regulator puts out. How much you're actually regulating, yep. And then... Anybody not actually ever touched this regulator, this style? You? You? All right. Here. Jess. Get out of here. Here. Okay. So I mentioned it yesterday, but the way that you turn this, yeah, do you remember? Would be, yeah, it's the opposite. So you close it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're closing it down, then you're pushing against the, the valve in there. You're pushing the valve open. So as you close it, it'll allow more pressure from your tank to come out, your, uh, the, out the regulated side. Yep. And then when it's time to um, turn off your nitrogen, turn off your tank, you, what you do first is you turn off your tank. You let whatever pressure is still sitting in the regulator out. Then you back feed this all the way up so that the next guy who turns on the the tank, it's not pumped down. Like, this is what will typically happen, a safety problem. You'll have an empty tank, and you're trying to get everything out of it, so you crank it all the way down to finish your job. Then you move the regulator to your new tank. You turn it on. Well, you've cranked it all the way down. So full pressure that the regulator can produce is now going to just blast out of there. So just make it a habit whenever you're turning it off, taking it off. You also back this out right here. So, cool. What's some other things you can use nitrogen for besides just pressurizing a system? Blow out a drain line. Blow out a drain line. Anybody seen a drain line blown out with nitrogen? Glorious. Yeah. It's it awesome. can be a lot of fun. Especially when you see all the baby food goo come out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I'm going to try to touch as minimum as possible, so I'm keeping like my gloves off and my glasses off unless I actually get close to something or touch something. So you guys can touch everything, hopefully. That's my goal. If you see me touching something, yell at me, put my gloves on or whatever, or to back away and take over, so you guys can take over. Five, 600 PSI through it. Yeah, and you can watch on your gauge, and you can watch on here, you can watch the PSI, and actually see as you're adding it in. 
if you're hitting something solid, that PSI is just going to jump really fast, and you need to be ready to actually stop what you're doing and figure out something else. To Best thing to do is get a ball valve on the end of one of your lines. Get an old line. Yeah. Just have a ball valve on it. Yep. Do any of these hoses? Like 200 PSI and just open the ball valve. That's yeah. what I do. Yeah, that's you great. You can't really. So you're presetting. That's a really good idea. You're presetting your refrigerant pressure from your regulator to like 200 psi and then on your hose you have a lot of hoses have ball valves or just install a ball valve I have a hose specifically with a drain drain dog attached to it um, for blowing out and that's a good idea I'm gonna get make sure that my hose actually has a ball valve so I can preset it instead of slowly cranking it and watching yep. it yep that's great good advice okay in, out to our tank. That's all you're missing, right? Out to our tank. Which, uh, which side of the tank would we want to liquid? Yep. You right? Okay. Cool. Should I get fastened in? Um, you're good. Just wanted to show that you did it. I don't see any problems here, other than this isn't plugged in. Which, sure. well, I don't understand what what's the what's the issue here. Yeah, we're just hanging out. <laughs> yeah. Just trying to hang out here. All right, great. Uh, last last safety review would be torches. Uh, we did this. We went over this. What do we talk about torches and safety? They're scary. They're scary. What? Which is the most dangerous of these two? Oxygen. Oxygen. Because if there's a fire. You feed it oxygen, that fire, it becomes a bomb, right? So if your warehouse is on fire and you, worry, and you have time to get something out, get your oxygen out. Your, your acetylene tank might blow up, it might explode, but in the event of a large fire or even something, you know, the, the flame's already consuming most of the oxygen in that space and it's keeping it contained. But if you have a tank of oxygen or something in there that can feed that, boom, you go crazy. Whereas if most of your oxygen is contained and you release more gas, it's not nearly as dangerous as, release, uh, as an accident that releases a lot of oxygen to a fire. So, Either way, flammable pressure, anything that flammable under pressure is very dangerous. So um, where is this going to be the most likely to, to blow up? In your van. Hmm? In your van. In the van. That's right. An accident. Falling over, forgetting to turn it off, that sort of thing. Um, good. So that's that's pretty good as a review, right? Yeah. yeah? All right. We, we've reviewed. So we'll move on to today's safety, new safety topic. Okay. So rumor is there are there is at least one refrigerant in this training room that is highly flammable, and so first one to find that one wins. In the meantime, note the different refrigerants that you're seeing and how dangerous they are and uh, their class on here. So you can use the refrigerant slider app or you can use the chart that, that, that I showed you on the book, uh, page 63, and find out what, what safety class they are. Go! Woo! All right, this should be good. We found it. Well, I didn't find it, but Matt did. We got one over here that's not classified A1. So A would be the level of tox toxicity. I got that right. Yeah. And uh, one would be the level of flammability. And most refrigerants that we work around are going to be A1, except for we got one in here. Right here. What is it, Matt? R123. And what's its classification? B1. How'd you find that out? Through the slider app. Slider app. Cool, cool. That was exciting. So let's uh, let's not set anything on here on fire. That's what we learned. Cool. Thanks, guys. Let's move on next. So next, we're just going to go over some uh, of the refrigeration circuit. We've been talking about refrigerant all night and safety, but we'll actually do something a little more um, helpful for our jobs technically. Let's go over the refrigerant circuit, so I'm trying to say. So let's go over, find a piece of equipment, take it apart. We'll follow the circuit, talk about it. What I would really like is if you're unfamiliar with some part of the circuit, 
or you want to know more about a certain part of the circuit, you ask some questions as we're talking about it, pointing it out. Um, is there anybody here that feels nervous at the thought of being the person who shows everybody else here what the refrigerant circuit is and actually walks all of us through the piece of equipment? Is there anybody here that feels nervous about that? Josh, great. I already knew that about you. Yeah? A little bit nervous? Yeah. One part of the circuit? Christian nodded. He twitched. I don't want to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to make anybody do it. So I'm just trying to gauge, like, oh, and here we go, confession. I'm just trying to gauge, you know, where you guys are with refrigeration circuit. It's so fun because basic memorization is really important, but each part of that circuit, the layers get so thick with what you can learn and what you can know about it practically. So we should have some fun going into this. Yeah, Chad? Um, for homework. Homework. On. Yeah, it was a good video. Basic refrigeration circuit. You can watch that every day and it would be helpful for your jobs. Um, so, Leslie, you want to grab a, uh, Leslie, oh my gosh, I told you I would do that. Jessica, I knew a Leslie in our company that had red hair and looked very similar to you. So, I'm going to do that a couple times, just like I told Damien, I'm going to call him Damien. Jessica, you want to open the air handler. Let's do this one right here. Since we got the whole unit. Sure, you can use someone's drill here if you like. There's an impact. Okay. He set it here just for you. So we're doing the air handler on the Yep. Do you have safety glasses by any chance? I took them off. Yep, I do. Okay. Nick, you want to watch or open the condenser? Yeah. So we're. I want to go inside the condenser and go through the circuit and the inside. So if you could take the top off. Something I like to tell people when you take the top off. We'll just watch how Nick does this. So let's go ahead and just get oh, you some gloves, gloves since we talked yeah, about yeah. this. About Keep your hands safe. Let me go grab my gloves. You got your own gloves? Okay. Teachable moment just happened. Safety. <laughs> this is our safety night. Absolutely. And so. And then, um, and then disconnect the fan. Yep. And then take your nuts off, or make sure that your wires aren't going to get caught, and then you take the fan blade off. Okay. So where where would you verify that power's off? I would cut this off. Disconnect box. Okay. And then I would take my meter and test the. We got contactor. a meter. And then before I touch anything, I would take. I got one here. Without leads? Take the, I have uh, leads. <laughs> she doesn't believe in leads. <laughs> then Just go on wireless. Disconnect the wires <laughs> to the rest of the fan, <laughs> and then you would be successfully ready to pull it off. Cool. Cool. Thank he is absolutely right. So I forgot to safety check that we don't have power for the unit that's sitting in the middle of the room. How about, because how about that? Because we should not take for granted ever that what we're working on doesn't have power, even when it seems obvious. But um, we should, that's, that is how you get shocked. So, yep. So uh, first, uh, this will probably be next week's lesson, uh, electrical safety. How do you check for safety? You want to do that? Yeah. What's the proper way to check if a unit is safe? Uh, you verify that it's in the Off. opposition. Okay. And then you take this little doodad here. To that right there. Okay. And All right. So he's taking the meter, and he's turned it to. Let's let's go yeah, ahead. Let's go put it on right bolts. On. Yep. Bolts. This is not my meter. Yep. It's not your meter. So there you go. You okay. Verify that it so he's verified. He's got zero. So does it? Does everyone agree that this is the proper way? Uh, 
to verify that the unit is safe to work on. Whoa, I saw the lens move. It's actually not the proper way to verify that the unit's safe to work on. Why? Because if you get shocked, it's because you're ground. So you should always test the ground when you're checking for safety. Oh, yeah. like this. Mm -hmm. And I've been shocked with this. So the scenario that, yep, exactly, that's safety. So now you've touched both legs to ground, and you know your unit's safe. The scenario we went over last night where the breaker losing one leg of power. One leg for show. Yeah. It would show you zero volts on the bottom where he did, and you would still have 120 on each side. So that's how I got shocked. Cool. All right. You're good. Nick, you can go ahead and, and do your thing. Put it back on. Uh, take it off, actually. I'm going to go over the refrigerant circuit inside of there. Oh, somebody has been playing with this fan. Mm -hmm. So why don't we unwire the fan? And you guys are going to learn this pretty quick about Brian. One of his pet peeves, which is good, is that he always takes the fan off electrically before he flips, before he flips it. it. Because of uh, how easy it is to bend a blade or to cut wires on an edge if you have more pressure than this. You cut wires. And so that's probably the safest way it looks like. Let me just get this out of here. Let's just uh, get this out of our sight. Cool. OK, refrigerant circuit. The heart of our circuit is the? Compressor. Compressor. Yep. And it's what pumps our refrigerant. So uh, what do we got coming into our compressor? Uh, um, low pressure, low temperature, vapor, refrigerant. Yep. Low pressure. Okay. And which line is that? Go ahead and touch the line that the low pressure, low temperature, vapor, refrigerant. This You're right. This would be the suction line right here. Yep. So the larger one you, you have coming into your compressor? It's going to be your suction line, and it's going to be the cold uh, to your hand. Usually, pull to the touch, low pressure refrigerant. Okay, and then what do we have coming out? That will be high the hot pressure, one. high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the one that burns you. The one that'll burn the shit out of Yep. Yep. And Abraham's right. It's high pressure. High temperature. High temperature. Vapor. Vapor. Now, a lot of people think that liquid comes out of your compressor. That's just like this thing that people go to. They know that liquid needs to be made somewhere, and that, that compressor looks really important. So you get vapor in, liquid out. But no, you're not going to be able to compress liquid in this compressor without just smashing the, the, the destroying the compressor, slugging. slugging it. Yep. Liquid can be compressed, actually. It can be, yeah, technically. Yeah. But this thing's not built for that. This no, thing will fall oh, apart. I said I can't. Yeah. Oh, you said can't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, everything can be on one level or another, but yeah, you would need some major. Yeah. You don't, you're not going to try to compress liquid. You'll never see anything successfully compress liquid in uh, the refrigerant circuit. So, um, what does this do to the refrigerant? That compresses the refrigerant, so it comes in as a low temperature, mm -hmm. low uh, pressure vapor, mm -hmm. goes in the compressor, the compressor compresses the, the refrigerant, once it's compressed, it goes out because it's compressed as a high pressure, high temperature yep. vapor. And that yep. goes through the, the what we call the liquid line. Discharge. The, the discharge. The discharge, yep. exactly, the discharge. And then like I said, that liquid is really tempting to talk right, about coming out of the like compressor. The discharge <laughs> and then it starts yeah. Uh, rejecting heat. Yeah. So we call it the compressor because it compresses the refrigerant, smashes the refrigerant. And so the refrigerant coming in at low temperature actually gets, uh, becomes high temperature because it has been compressed. Because the particles in there have been smashed, now we have high friction, 
which gives us that high temperature. So you could come in to something that compresses and without adding any heat, you could compress a substance and it would become really high temperature without adding any heat just by compressing it. Um, so that's part of the magic of, of the compressors that you can manipulate the heat that way. And like he said, when you do that, you also have high pressure, right? And that's what gives it the force to actually be shooting out of the compressor. And so that's why, that's why it also acts as a pump. It comes in, you smash it, and it's forcing it out in that direction. It opens back up, and it's sucking in uh, on the suction line. So, cool. All right, so where do we go next? If we're a heat pump like we are looking at here, we're going into this valve. What's this valve called? Reversing valve. Reversing valve. Reversing valve. Yep. And if the, uh, depending upon which way the valve is, has slidden, you're, you're, uh, we'll, just, uh, we'll just follow the circuit in cool mode. How about we just stick with yeah. cool mode? All right. So in cool mode, it's going to come out of that valve and go on what line? Does it come out of the valve liquid? Discharge. So it's still discharge. Yeah. Still discharge, but it feeds into the condenser. So if you see coming out of here, the top here that's looping around, it goes down there into the bottom of that condenser, and you have other capillary tubes feeding into different coils. So what state is the refrigerant when it enters the condenser? Still vapor. Yep. Still high temperature. Yep. And then the condenser. Why is it called a condenser? Because it condenses. Exactly. Condenses. Why is the evaporator called evaporator? Evaporates. Evaporates the refrigerant inside of it. You have to do the hand thing. Yep. <laughs> suction line is called the suction line because it's being sucked back towards the compressor. Discharge called the discharge line. Discharge out of the compressor. Yeah. Amazing. Did I just blow your mind, Chad? <laughs> or are you falling asleep? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we are coming in as a hot vapor gas, high pressure, and circulating through here. And when you take a high pressure gas, refrigerant gas, and you're still contained in that high pressure environment, but you start releasing its heat, that refrigerant is going to reach a point, the saturation point, where it starts condensing. Phase change. Yeah, phase change. So. How does it that, that the refrigerant releases its heat here? Defend, defend sucks air from outside and blow, blows it out, rejects it, yeah. Yeah. So it's basically yeah, sucking the air from here. Mm -hmm. It's going Coils. through the, the coil. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, um, it, yeah. Yeah. So you discharge. You, you need to get rid of the heat that came in on the suction line. So the suction line feels really cold to your hand, but it's actually loaded with heat that it's absorbed from whatever the space is. All the heat that has been removed from that space is inside that suction line that feels cold to your hand. Mm -hmm. And it feels cold because it's low pressure. And it comes in and it gets smashed so that you can raise it above the outdoor temperature and reject it using the outdoor air. So the whole purpose of that smashing is to actually raise that temperature of, that is already loaded with heat from the evaporator now we're going to raise that temperature above outdoor temperature enough that we can reject the heat that we absorbed from our evaporator. So as that fan runs, it's pulled across these fins, and there's a heat transfer. So when you put your hand above the unit and you feel that warm air, where did that warm air come from? The, the, coil, the, the pipe in the drain. Yep, from the refrigerant, the discharged gas. And where did that refrigerant pick up that heat that you're feeling on your hand? Inside the house. Inside the house. Inside the house. So that heat was literally 30, 60 seconds ago inside your living room space floating around. And now it's floating around outside right here. Same heat. So cool stuff. Different air, same heat. Same energy. OK, so um, that state where it starts condensing, but it hasn't fully condensed yet. What do we call that state? Saturation. Saturation. Yep. It happens right. Mm -hmm. Right around here. Yeah. Well, it starts happening pretty pretty quickly in the coil, 
And you're right, it happens all the way through till the base of that coil when it's going to come out, the liquid line. Yeah. On this coil, as you can see, it's feeding into the bottom and actually coming out of the top. So, but yes, exactly what's happening. Okay, so saturation means that we are in a mixed state. It's still in process of changing. So all of the energy that it's getting rid of is not actually, when it's in saturation, it's not actually lowering the temperature of that refrigerant. Even though it's getting rid of heat, that refrigerant stays a constant temperature while it's in saturation until it becomes fully liquid. Once it changes state, then it actually drops in temperature and comes out of this line as a, out, out of the condenser as a, liquid. yep, liquid, high pressure high actually. High pressure, high temperature. Liquid, yep. And so this liquid, um, we take a measurement on our liquid line to try to prove something. What is it? Subcool. Subcool, yep. So we try to prove that it's actually liquid by taking this measurement. So when we hook up our gauges, we have a pressure, our saturation pressure, right? And um, uh, our PSI, and that, based on that PSI, it gives us our, pr our saturation. And then we take a measurement on the line to see if we're actually below or above that. And we know if we've reached liquid. If a liquid line comes out liquid, it's usually close to outdoor temperature, maybe about 7, 10 degrees above outdoor temperature and it comes into the air handler, into our metering device. What type of metering device is this? The orifice. She was absolutely right. Yep. Yep. And oftentimes we'll call it a piston. Um, and so what other types of metering devices do you run into? TXV. EEV, yep. Yep. Or even on some refrigeration applications, you'll have just uh, smaller capillary tubes. The tubes will just be small enough to be the restriction. Yeah. And that's the exact same as this. It's a fixed metering device at that point. Uh, you want to go ahead and, and open the rest of this so we can get the, a coil view? That's okay. At least everyone's getting some something on. Not that you don't touch this stuff every day already. You've been opening that and cleaning out the drain pans, right? Okay. The first thing I do is check the filter and I reach in uh -huh. and the drain pan underneath. Yeah. I found ice in one the other day. All right. That was fun. Okay, so we already established what does the evaporator do? It evaporates what? Just what he said, the liquid refrigerant. If you don't have liquid refrigerant coming in, you're not going to be able to evaporate the refrigerant. You're not going to be able to create low pressure, low temperature saturation through this coil. So the refrigerant comes into the coil on the liquid. It's restricted which causes your pressure drop and immediately that refrigerant under with an extreme re pressure drop reaches the uh, a pressure that it'll start boiling. So you have lower pressure on the other side of that pressure drop and that refrigerant will immediately start flashing and boiling. It'll come through these tubes and then hit the rest of the coil and expand even more and because an expansion is, is low pressure, you're creating low pressure. So the molecules that were really tight, high heat friction, now they're allowed to relax. They're not rubbing each other, there's not as much friction, there's more space for them. And so you're reading a lower pressure on this side of your system with your gauge outside and that, that low pressure is why you have low temperature. But also, because it's going from a liquid and it's boiling into a vapor, we, all, we have saturation inside this coil, right? And um, that process of saturation, I lost my train of thought, where was I? 
Yeah. So let's go. Let's start. Let's go in here. So as the coil it comes in really cold, uh, still mostly liquid, and it's starting to boil, right? And then what is the job of this evaporator coil in relation to what we're trying to accomplish with air conditioning? Yep. Absorbs the heat, which generates colder air coming out of the top. So the air that comes in warm, the evaporator absorbs as much heat as it can because it's much colder than the air temperature and comes out colder. Exactly. So that energy that's being absorbed is going into that refrigerant and it is causing that refrigerant to continue boiling as the heat is entering that refrigerant, that energy is being used to finish the boiling process inside there. So same thing with the condenser, when it's in a saturated state, it doesn't change temperature until it's finished and become fully, either fully vapor or fully liquid. It doesn't change temperature. So you can have a coil that's 42 degrees in saturation. All the heat coming into it, it stays 42 degrees until it's fully boiled. So all that heat energy that's going in is being used to boil, not actually being used to change the temperature. It's being used up in the boiling process. Once the refrigerant becomes fully vapor, it starts raising in heat. And we call that superheat, exactly. Superheat is the measurement that how far above saturation we've come, how far above that boiling have we come. If it's still boiling, it's going to be exact temperature. It's not going to raise in temperature until it's finished. So if we hook up our pressures and we see that we have a 42 degree saturation, we know our coil is 42 degrees until it becomes fully vapor. Then we take a measurement on our suction line and we see that this is 52 degrees. So we've, we know we've picked up 10 degrees of heat after we've become fully vapor then we've raised in temperature. So it proves us that we're fully vapor coming out of the suction line. And then that takes us back to where we started. What happens to this vapor that's 52 degrees? Mm -hmm. And even though the temperature is 52 degrees, it's loaded with heat. It's absorbed lots of heat through this whole process. It's loaded with heat. It's still low pressure. It's not high friction, so that heat's in there. It's just waiting for something to smash it so that it actually becomes high temperature and you can get rid of the heat outside in your outside air. So, okay, so let's hook up to a real system, pressures, temperature clamps, and just hit this really quick again uh, with live readings. What? Okay, all right. All right, so I'm yeah. gonna go. Yep, liquid valve. All right, mate. Yeah, like I said, those can be a little awkward. Just find yourself a really good angle that you know you can go fast. And yep, this that way. Oh, you're just threading it in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't me. Oh. <laughs> All right. Somebody shine on the on the gauge. What do we have on our gauge? All right. You are successful. You were successful. You see how that didn't hiss or, or give you any refrigerant? That is a low loss valve and that is essential for gauge safety. Some version of that. That one's the yellow jacket, which I like. And you're dealing with less pressure, but still a dangerous amount of pressure on your suction. But it, it's vapor. So if you are dumping it, you're not going to have the freeze effect that you do on liquid. Okay. So uh, who's got temperature clamps? Hey, we'll go ahead and hook the temperature clamps up inside just for ease. Let's do that. Okay. No, we're not. Please get them. Hook them up inside. Turn them on. Okay, Chad's gonna go hook up the clamps inside and we're gonna check them out wirelessly. Yep. Who's Mine. 
Anybody you want to look at? Crank. What's that? It's be real grainy, but... All right, so as we look at our pressures, um, tell me what refrigerant that we're working on. That's going to be important. Your data tag's probably on the other corner. Hey, look at that. The data tag's peeled off. It's more than likely. Okay, so we're working with Fortune A, we can tell by our pressures. <laughs> yep, and the should be a safety tag on the inside. Yep, on that tag. Only, Fortune A only. Okay, so what, uh, what PSI do we got? Somebody on our suction line. So this is our vapor, low temperature. 105. 105, okay. So what saturation is 105 for Fortin A refrigerant? It's what? We're dealing with Fortin A. Yeah, 32. Yeah, it's probably 32. Yep. And 32 degrees. Yep. So 32 degrees of saturation. So that means our coil on the suction line is currently experiencing a pressure of 105, which puts our saturation temperature at 32 degrees. If you're if you're warmer than 32 degrees, that refrigerant's going to be vapor. If you're at 32 degrees, it's going to be saturation. It's going to still have liquid in it. It's going to still be boiling. So if a temperature clamp shows 32 degrees coming off of that um, evaporator, we know we are at zero. There it is. All right, he pulled it up on the app. So what do we got on our temperature for the suction? 69. Nice. Woo! Oh, that's pretty extreme. That's pretty extreme. Okay, so somebody give me my superheat. Superheat is the measurement of how far above saturation has our, has our temperature gone. 37? That's really high. This thing is not running very well. It sounds like we need to have a diagnostic here at some day. Yeah. All right, let's get our subcool then. So, What's our, what's our head pressure? 270, around 270. Maybe 265. And what is our saturation? 90. 89. 89 degrees saturation. So, Based on the pressure we have on that line, if our temperature is 89 degrees, we're still going to be in saturation. If our temperature has gone below 89, we're going to be fully liquid. Because you remember, it does not change in temperature during saturation, not until it's fully become a different state. Not until it's fully become, if it's on the condensing side, full liquid, then it changes temperature. So, what's our liquid line temperature? Read. So we have four. No, this is a sub point app. So you can see that, 85? Yeah. Everybody see 85 on the liquid line temperature. So this is giving us the actual temperature of our refrigerant. And this is giving us the saturation that this pressure is. So inside the coil, this thing is 89 degrees. By the time it comes out of the coil, 85. Um, almost 86. What's our subcool? Four. Okay, if it's 85, it's four. That's 85.5, so we're gonna go 3.5. Yeah. So, pretty low subcool, 3.5. And a high superheat. Anybody know? Anybody know what low subcool, high superheat means? Low refrigerant. All right. You guys, nailed this. Significant. Okay. Very nice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> let's throw let's throw in a TXP tonight and just see what happens. Yeah. 
Okay, so discharge lines coming straight out of the compressor. That's going to be the hottest point, right? Coming straight out of there right after it was smashed. Review. What, what substance is the refrigerant? What state? Vapor. Vapor on the discharge line. Discharge line, vapor. That comes straight out of the compressor. It's going to be high temperature. Does anybody know what too high is? At what point is that temperature too high for the health of our compressor and our, our system? Above 130. Anything above 225. Fahrenheit. Anything above 225 will actually start breaking down the oils in the system so that your oil will become acidic and no longer be able to lubricate your compressor. So um, those kind of situations can be easily found on a rooftop unit or if you have a dirty condenser coil or you have a fan that's not actually moving well or maybe the fan's set too low in there so not enough air is coming out. You're not releasing the heat from that discharge line. And so that heat, that temperature is going to keep rising and rising and rising. You, you run it over 225 sustained and you're going to break down your oil.